this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to the next reading, the 53rd reading already, of the wonderful book by Steve Wahlberg, which is titled End Time Delusions. He deals with the delusions, the Antichrist that is in existence for hundreds of years, puts on us. The veil he puts on the truth, as he forbids people to read the Bible, he gets his own eschatology out there and that is a quote-unquote rapture, that is a quote-unquote left behind, that is a quote-unquote uh, tribulation, is quote-unquote seven-year tribulation and I could go on and on and on. We discussed all that in the foregoing four, uh, 52 parts of this reading. Me, that is Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and me, Jörg, from Hour of the Truth. And today we are going to finish that chapter 20, the path of the virus, go into chapter 21, probably. Let's see where it's going to take us. But first, let us welcome Brother Tom Fress from the United States of America over there on the Big Pond. Hello, Tom, and well, warmly welcome to the broadcast. Yes, hello, Jörg, and nice to be with you. And uh, hello to the listeners and uh, anxious to continue our study. I've um, been reading some of the comments uh, posted on the videos, and it, it appears that many people are beginning to comprehend the truth. And, and what I would love to hear from the listeners is a, a comment that I would make after hearing something like this, and that is that the truth makes far more sense than the futurist lies that are taught from the churches in this country. Listen, historicism is as simple and as plain and as understandable as the truth normally is. But futurism is mystifying. It's magical. It's something predicted that will never be proven. Listen, 
here's something that's very crafty about futurism. If you predict something that's going to happen in the future and you know it's a lie, it's not, it's never going to come to pass. Who's ever going to know that it was a lie? Stop and think about it. If you prophesy something that's going to happen in the future, knowing that it's never going to come to pass, and you make everybody believe what you prophesied is true, who's going to prove you wrong? Nobody. That's what is so convenient about futurism. They forecast a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, and it's never going to happen because the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, Jesus performed 2,000 years ago. And we have the historical proof of that fact, which is the New Testament of our Bibles. When somebody asks you about the Daniel's prophecy, you can say it is fulfilled. And someone may ask you, well, how do you know Daniel's prophecy is fulfilled? Then you can read to them the New Testament, and in that New Testament displays every jot and every tittle of Daniel's 70-week prophecy fulfilled right there there in plain English. You can't get it wrong. But how, how certain can any futurist be about this future 70th week of Daniel that's never going to come to pass? As long as it's to be fulfilled in the future, no one will ever be the wiser that it was a lie from the get-go. And that's just how clever the Jesuits are. You have a more sure word of prophecy. You have the historicist truth. You have the prophecy of Daniel as recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. And then you have the historical record of its fulfillment in the New Testament. Aren't you lucky? No one can argue with you. You simply show them the New Testament and say, which part of Daniel's prophecy is not recorded in the New Testament as having been fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago? Put the onus of proof on them and let them read the New Testament and find out with their own eyes that every I is dotted, every T is crossed in Daniel's prophecy. And you have the infallible, divinely inspired, New Testament word of God proving Daniel's 70th week prophecy is over. You have certainty. You have the most sure word of prophecy. You don't have anything in the future. You have historical fulfillment that no one in a, with a righteous heart and a righteous mind can gainsay or, or, or deny. You have the most sure word of Bible prophecy. Historicism. That is the, the, the interpretation of Bible prophecy that says Daniel's 70th week it was fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And there is no future fulfillment. That is the historicist truth. And that is the most senior of all schools of Bible prophecy interpretation. And it's not only that, it's the only one that can be proven to be correct. Stop and think what I've just told you. Futurism can never be proven to be wrong because it's never going to be fulfilled. 
Isn't that fortunate for the papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, that has deceived the whole world and has deceived all the Protestant evangelical churches to, co- to teach them to believe a lie and put them on the outs with their own Savior? That's exactly what it has accomplished. We, his people, have angered him beyond our ability to comprehend. And what's left for us is nothing but on our faces in sackcloth and ash, repentance of our futurist lies, and return to the historical, the ancient, the righteous and true interpretation of Bible prophecy, historicism. Back to you, uh, Yerk. Yeah, that's a very good point you are making there, that futurism can never be proven because it never happens, but historicism can be proven because all the prophecies have been fulfilled. Well, listen, I don't want to get into a big discussion. I, I may even regret bringing this up, but you and I are in agreement about one thing. I mean, lots of people uh, adore Ellen G. White from the from the uh, uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. But she prophesied something that is never going to be witnessed to be fulfilled. And that is the so-called investigative judgment. And so many people believe in this so-called investigative judgment. And I'm not even going to go into what the investigative judgment is. But she prophesied it. That that, that 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 will come to pass, this investigative judgment. It's in, it's in the fulfillment right now, according to Seventh-day Adventist teaching. But nobody's witnessing it. It can't be recorded in history because it can't be witnessed. It cannot be fulfilled in history because it's something that's supposed to be taking place invisibly in heaven right now. Okay? And you and I agree. No prophecy is of any good if it cannot be fulfilled in history so that the world can witness it it can these prophecies can never be a witness for the truth can never be a witness for Christ if they are invisible and cannot be valid, validated or verified in this world there can never be a historical writing documenting the historical fulfillment of the so-called investigative judgment. Therefore, we we reject it. It cannot be a Bible prophecy. It cannot be a prophecy from God. Well, the same measure goes against futurism. It will never be witnessed in the world as having been fulfilled, and therefore it cannot be historically recorded, and therefore it cannot be a witness for the truth. A Bible prophecy is useless if it cannot be witnessed by God's people as having been fulfilled in history. Daniel prophesied the coming of Messiah at the end of the 69th week and the very beginning of the 70th week. There would be a seven-year period of time beginning at his baptism, three and a half years later his crucifixion where he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by completely doing away with sin. Okay? And then three and a half years later, uh, the gospel continued to be preached to the Jews and to Jerusalem until the record, the infallible record of the New Testament verifies to us that the Jews and Jerusalem rejected the, the gospel. The 490th year had expired. They stoned Stephen and said, if you know you don't consider yourself worthy of salvation, we go to the Gentiles. I have a listener written to me and said, how do we know that that last three and a half years is over? Because the gospel has gone to the Gentiles. That's how we know. They stoned Stephen. Jerusalem and the Jews proved their rejection of the gospel when they stoned Stephen the last witness for Christ to the Jew and to Jerusalem. They stoned him to shut him up. And then the gospel went to the Gentiles, the house of Cornelius, and now all over the world. You want to know if the last three and a half years is over? Just ask yourself the question, do the Jews carry the gospel to the world or do the Gentiles? 
If the answer is the Gentiles carry the gospel to the world, then you know the last three and a half years is over because Daniel's prophecy prophesied seven years. We know that began at his baptism. We know three and a half years later he caused the sacrifice and oblations to cease, and we know that the gospel was to be preached only to the Jews until the end of that 70th week, the end of the 490th year. Jesus said repeatedly, go not into the way, unto the way of the Gentiles. The gospel was to be preached to the Jews and to Jerusalem until the end of the 490th year. That's why in Daniel chapter 9 it says in verse 24, 70 years are determined upon thy people yes. and upon thy holy city. It's right. only the it Jews. Says. And right. Jesus Only and Jesus Jews also Jesus also spoke to a Gentile woman I think once or twice in the New Testament uh, during his ministry and said this is not for you I came to save the Jews. That's right. Yep. I, I the the New Testament is the historical proof positive infallible record of the finishing of the the beginning and the finishing of the 70th week of Daniel. That's what the New Testament is. It is the witness of the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. And if you read it in that context, you'll see it for yourself. You don't need you don't need Yerk, you don't need Tom Fress to walk you through the New Testament and show you every place. Yet we've done that for the listeners. We showed you every place in the New Testament that covers every tenet of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. You've heard it with your own ears. If you've read the New Testament, you've seen it with your own eyes. You have to come to the conclusion that the New Testament was written primarily for the purpose of documenting the historical fulfillment, the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. Now, that cannot be denied. No honest heart can deny that the New Testament records every jot and every tittle of Daniel's prophecy. That's a, that's a, that's a fantastic reality. When, when, when somebody, like I said before, when somebody says, how do you know the 70th week of Dan, the 70 weeks of Daniel is over? Just tell them to read the New Testament. Put Daniel's prophecy on a three by five card in your left hand and read the New Testament with your right hand and see if there's anything lacking in the New Testament. There's not one jot or one tittle. Every I is dotted. Every T is crossed. You have an infallible, historical, and perfect record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. And from that point on, anybody that tells you that there's a future fulfillment of, or any portion of that 70th week to be fulfilled in the future, you, can, you know they're lying. You know they're lying. There's no guesswork about it. There's no speculation about it. There's no nervous twitch about it. There's nothing but assurance. Assurance that that person is lying. He's either purposely lying to deceive you or he's just regurgitating all the crap that he's heard from the Protestant and evangelical churches in this country for the last 200 years. And all you've got to do is tell him, listen, fella, get a copy of Daniel's prophecy on a three by five card, read the New Testament for yourself, and if you can find one I that is not dotted, one T that is not crossed in the New Testament, then you come see me and don't expect to hear a word from him because it's all there, every jot and every tittle. And the idea of any future fulfillment of any portion of that, of that uh, a prophecy is ridiculous on its face. Ridiculous on its face. 
And anybody who would assert that any portion of the 70th week of Daniel is yet to be fulfilled in the future ought to be ashamed, ought to be embarrassed to tears. He's clearly not acquainted with the Word of God. He's clearly not acquainted with the New Testament. And I question, in many of them, their salvation. Because if they believe the future 70th week of Daniel, they deny the historical 70 week of Daniel, and that was Jesus' ministry. They're literally saying, Jesus has not come in the flesh. And what does the Bible say about that? That is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, who can be indwelt by the spirit of Christ and also indwelt by the spirit of Antichrist? You want the hideous truth? Nearly the entire Christian world. Isn't that the most hideous reality you can even imagine? Because you could count on one hand the historicists that you know in this world. Now, Tom, how can everybody be wrong and you be right? You tell me. That's a mystery I can't unravel. It's not a mystery, Tom. It's not about you being right. It's about the Bible being right. That's exactly right. You just right. quote the Bible. That's, That's all. Exactly right. It's not about you. It's not about me. Thank God. It's not it's about not Steve about Wahlberg. Me. It's about God and his infallible word that we have to read and to study to understand the prophecies given and see back in history the prophecies being fulfilled. Yep. It's not about any man. That's exactly right. Not it's with not, our, not, not, not with man. us in this ministry that we are talking about here. Mm. It's all about a man in the Antichrist world. It's all about the Pope. And it's yeah. all about the spirit of the power of the air. And when you know your Bible, you know who that is. Yes, and once in a while, and I have to address this before we continue with the book, one thing that continually plagues me is listeners that will say, well, yeah, we know the papacy is the Antichrist, but the last pope will be the Antichrist. Yeah, I like this one guy in the comment today in the last yes, uh, 50, I read it. 50 let, second let you, uh, video. Let yeah. me tell you, I used to be in that camp, and I'm admitting it publicly. And I'm also on my face in sackcloth and ashes. I was wrong. The papacy, from the first pope to the last, whenever that is, is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. The institution of the papacy is that man of sin, that son of perdition, the one who fulfills all the Bible prophecies as recorded in history, is the Antichrist. You don't look for a future Antichrist. You have him in full bloom every day, all day long, no matter what generation you live in. Okay? Wherever Christians are, Antichrist rules. That's the way it's been since the 5th century. The last pope is only distinguished by this one thing. He is the pope that will see Christ's return. He is the Antichrist that will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming and the spirit of his mouth. But that's the only thing that distinguishes the last pope from every other pope in succession, from the first to the last. So don't let anybody tell you, 
Well, the papacy is the beast or the antichrist, but the last pope, he's the antichrist. He's the antichrist. He's a liar. He doesn't fully understand, and uh, he needs to keep listening and keep his mouth shut until he has understanding. Okay? He's no different than I was when I was wrong. So, the best advice I have for people still lacking understanding is to begin at the beginning of this series and listen to every broadcast and pay close attention. Don't let your mind wander and drift. Pay close attention and you'll see we know what we're talking about and it isn't just us. This was the belief of all true Bible-believing Christians forever in the past, up until about 200 years ago. Only 200 years ago was futurism ever even known in the Protestant and evangelical churches. Historicism was the only school of Bible prophecy interpretation prior to about 200 years ago. And every Bible-believing Christian prior to about 200 years ago knew in his heart from the scriptures and from history that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. It's only our generation that's got it wrong. So let's shoulder up the responsibility and mend our ways and return to Christ and reject Antichrist! Back to you, Yerk. Uh, while we're at it, Tom, you just uh, mentioned something that I want to go into for, for a short moment. Uh, you said uh, that people should watch from the first video of the series on, and as I said in the beginning, this is the 53rd recording. So there have been 52 before these. Uh, the very first seven are something special, and I'm going to uh, explain that. Uh, when we'd finished chapter 21, but from the very first one that we did of the last 52, it is necessary to, to, to understand. I, you don't, when you, when you start reading a book, uh, you don't open it somewhere in the middle and start reading. You start in the beginning, right? Now, the point is that Tom and I, we are very uh, fond of new listeners. We appreciate new listeners coming to these videos. We appreciate quote-unquote truth seekers. We appreciate quote-unquote new Christians, new born-again Christians or even not born-again still seeking, still following the voice of the Father leading them to Jesus Christ. Coming through our videos, through our channels, watching what we have to offer and with that getting help in understanding. We appreciate that very much. But when you come and you watch <coughs> sorry, and you watch a video like number 52 right now or 48 or 36, it doesn't matter which number, and you're interested in that, and then you comment on that, and especially people who comment during a live premiere in the live chat, and have no understanding that we talked abundantly about the subjects of the rapture, of the seven-year tribulation, and of all that, all those things. It is necessary for you to go back to the beginning and start watching with the first part. Now we always try to do about a, se a session of about an hour, so that means you have to spend 52 or even more hours to watch all this. But the question that you have to ask yourself is, how hard do I want to live in the truth, or am I satisfied with a lie? And if you want to know the truth, you want to know the whole truth. When you want to read the Bible, you start the Bible in the New Testament in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, and you end in... Uh, uh, Revelation chapter 22, the last verse. You read it from A to Z. Because you know that Jesus Christ said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. So when you don't know the first, how can you know the last? 
even though we appreciate new viewers and listeners coming to these videos. We urge you, if you do not have the understanding to understand what is talked about in these parts that you are just listening to, go to the beginning, please, and you will understand. Do you have anything to add to that, Tom? No, I think that was necessary and it was well given and I, I it's the best advice one can give. Good, then we are now going into the 53rd reading that I already announced and here is the book of uh, Steve Wahlberg, which I give the picture to you right here in a second, End Time Delusions. Last time we uh, finished reading about uh, the late great planet Earth and Mr. Hal Lindsay and his deceptions. And uh, the author says here, through the late great planet Earth, the Jesuit virus of futurism made incredible progress in its ancient intelligence strategy to replace historicism as the prophetic operating system of the protestant world. Now enter left behind. In the 1990s, Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins took the future Mr. Evil idea of Hell Lindsay, took the future Mr. Evil idea of Schofield, Darby, Irving, Newman, Todd, Maitland and the Jesuit Ribera and turned it into, quote, the most successful Christian fiction series ever. Unquote, as stated in Publishers Weekly. Now why did I put the word fiction in blue color here? Because that is a true word about futurism. Futurism is fiction. It is the successful quote-unquote Christian fiction series ever. It is fiction. That is what Tom meant when he said futurism cannot be proven because it never happens. Or most people who learn about it do not live to see the fulfillment of it. The people who lived in the beginning of the 19th century when futurism was first taught through all the, uh, through all the pulpits in the churches, those people are long dead. They never saw futurism coming into fulfillment. But when they were betrayed by futurist teaching, they will see that they will be at the second resurrection and not at the first. Point is, the word fiction is very important here. It is a fiction series. I, I don't even like the word Christian in here. We should actually <laughs> uh, scrap the word uh, Christian and say that all these is the most successful fiction series ever. How about ever. Roman Catholic fiction? Yeah, Roman Catholic, but Christian yeah. does not just fit in there, I think so. <laughs> you can't mix the word Christian with Roman Catholic. And that's what the end time delusion does, huh? That's right. It takes the one for the other. It yep. posts as Christianity, but it is pagan Romanism. Now, Lindsay's book, the author continues, the late great planet Earth was largely theological, while Left Behind is a fast-moving sequence of highly imaginative novels, quote, overflowing with suspense, action and adventure, a Christian thriller, <laughs> or Catholic then, in this regard, Tom. <laughs> With quote a label, its uh, with a label its creators would never have predicted, blockbuster success from Entertainment Weekly. Yeah. The novels have reached the bestseller lists of New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and have even resulted in an interview of LaHaye and Jenkins on Larry King Live. Now, for the people who are not aware of this, Larry King. <laughs> is a host of a talk show on CNN, which I like to call Catholic News Network, but actually it is a cable news network. It was founded by a Knight of Malta, whose name just slips me for the Ted Turner, uh, a Knight of Malta who founded that channel. So don't think that on CNN, and especially with Larry King, you can get any truth. 
Exactly. I guess they even lie when they tell you how late it is. <laughs> <laughs> Left Behind books are now available at Walmart, Costco, Target, airports and inside countless stores. The central figure of this blockbuster series is Nikolai Carpathia, representing Mr. Nightmare himself, the after the rapture antichrist. <laughs> after the rapture. We should yeah. have put that in quotation marks. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the result? Through left behind, the virus of futurism has multiplied exponentially and practically taken over the prophecy-minded Christian world. Most Christians expect a future Antichrist, which means Protestantism's original operating system has crashed. Okay. Now, you're about to read a quote. Uh, let me, let me uh, interject something here. I want to speak to the older, or rather, the oldest of the listeners here. Anybody approaching 65 years old? Well, let me tell you something. I'm 65 years old, and I remember in my eighth grade year, no, rather ninth grade year, they let school out early so that we could all walk uptown to the theater and participate in a quote-unquote Christian matinee. Okay. The whole school let out, and the students were required to walk up down to a movie theater and watch a Christian movie. And guess what the title of that movie was? It was just like the Left Behind series of videos that had been so popular for so long a time. It was called, oh, for heaven's sakes, I've now, I've, the, it was, uh, uh, the name of it will come to me, but it was all about a seven-year period of time that begins with the rapture and airplanes crashing all over the place, cars running off the road, empty clothing laying all around where Christians by the multiple millions just simply disappeared. Trains running off the rails, airplanes, cars, automobiles crashing. People weeping over their children missing from their cribs. The rapture that had been be predicted by the, by the ne'er-do-well Christians for so long has finally been recognized as having come to pass. And then everybody that remained on the earth suddenly realized that they'd been left behind. And because they'd been left behind in order to achieve salvation, they had to die as martyrs. Lie upon lie, lie upon lie, from beginning, middle, and end. It was a lie. It was futurism taught way back in 1970, 1969, and 1970. And I'm, I'm, I'm still having trouble coming up with the name of it. Yeah, that's because you're getting old, brother. Nothing <laughs> about that. Ain't I, though? <laughs> 65 years old, losing, losing my edge. But the left behind concept as popular as it has become, was preceded by this movie that literally was shown in every church across this country. And it began the deception. And I really don't understand how LaHaye and his partner made so much money on this, except for that it was just one more generation of people that had swallowed the baloney hook, line, and sinker. The popularity of those two videos, uh, the one that I'm talking about and, and Tim LaHaye's videos, is just testimony to the apostasy, the prophetic, historical 
and biblical apostasy and illiteracy of Christianity today. That anyone would darken the door of a theater to see that video, that movie. That anybody would darken the door of a video pro, a video store to buy those LaHaye videos, the Left Behind series, is just testimony. And I realize that I'm probably offending about 95% of the people who are listening to this program. But we're not here to win friends and influence people. We're here to expose the truth. Anybody who bought those videos and listened and watched that movie have been deceived. That's Satan's business right there. That has this idea is what has destroyed Protestantism in this country. And because Protestantism is destroyed, those videos are popular. Those videos would never have found an interested listener were Protestantism alive and well in this country. We would have protested the Left Behind series of videos. The video, the, the movie was A Thief in the Night. It just came to me. A Thief in the Night was the name of the diabolical vi uh, movie that all of us kids were let out of school to go watch that day. A Thief in the Night. And it was just as popular at that time as the Left Behind series of videos are today. But the message was the same. Now, do you think the historicist truth is ever going to get a teenager out of school for a half a day to go watch a video about that? I guarantee you that if someone is resourceful enough to make a, 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 a worthy video representation of the historicist truth, it won't be supported by any of the churches. It won't be supported by any of the schools. It'll be publicly renounced if it is even acknowledged at all. Why? Because it makes all these others liars. And they don't want to be exposed. It's a hideous reality that in this so-called Christian nation, the truth is as rare as hen's teeth. And that's to put it mildly. And let me tell you something else about the truth tellers. They are persecuted. They're going to be persecuted. And their truth will never be heard except by those who God leads them to it. We're going to be in a permanent minority. But then the Bible plainly tells us that the truth, the gateway to the truth is narrow and few there be that find it. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom. And let me please allow to add something to this. While we're at it, I think this discussion needs to be mentioned. Um, you said that you were, quote-unquote, taken out of school to see that movie, right? What we just read here is that Entertainment Weekly labels this movie as um, a blockbuster success, that Publishers Weekly say about this most successful quote-unquote Christian fiction series ever, it was a success you couldn't go around. You couldn't miss it. But the problem is, and that's the point that I want to make, they got the people with entertainment. They didn't teach Bible, they entertained you. And that means they planted another understanding in your brain while keeping you amused, sitting in a chair in the uh, cinema, having the popcorn on your left hand, the Coke on your right hand, and watching a movie 
to be entertained. The difference with what Tom and I do here in this reading of this book is we are not entertaining. We are telling you the truth and we use for that truth as the basis the Bible. And none of these movies, none of that quote unquote fiction series, whether in books, movies, meaning in the cinema or on DVD or whatever, has ever been Bible based. It's entertainment. It addresses the mass. It's, it addresses the majority of the people. Now you tell me, have the majority of the people ever been right when you see it in the light of the Bible? Wasn't Israel more or less the smallest country? Wasn't it more or less the smallest people? It was a chosen people, that's right. But it was not a uh, how do you say the uh, uh, people the, other, the other joke. nations were, were jealous on you know because even though they were given the power but God wanted Israel to be to be a light in the world and everybody made jealous of it it never happened they were the smallest people or a very small people in the world the majority always has and had it wrong and when these movies are directed to the majority and you join that majority to enjoy those movies and to be entertained, you can bet on it that you will be betrayed. You will be part of the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. You will be end time, end time delusioned. That's the point that I want to make. But please, Tom, I hear it's burning on your tongue to make a comment. Yes, I, I have to. I have to at least conclude with this. Both the Left Behind series of videos and all the books attached to it, the LaHaye series, and A Thief in the Night of my generation, are nothing but anti-Protestant, Jesuit, Roman Catholic propaganda. Anti-Reformation propaganda. All of it is designed from the get-go, from cradle to grave, to destroy Protestantism. Okay? When, when, we, when you know what the content of those videos is, you can easily see that it is geared toward denying that the papacy is the Antichrist. Okay? That was the very foundation of Protestantism that the papacy is the Antichrist, that the papacy always was the Antichrist, and that the papacy always will be the Antichrist. That's why they protested the papacy, because the papacy is the Antichrist. But the Thief in the Night and the LaHaye series of books portray the Antichrist as a, as a single individual that comes just before Christ's return. But not until the rapture takes place first. Jesus comes first, the rapture takes place, and then the man of sin is revealed. Exactly opposite what the scripture plainly teaches. It says Jesus cannot return until that man of sin is revealed. That's what Paul said. Are we calling Paul a liar? The futurists are. The Jesuits are. The Roman Catholic Church is. The Protestants told you the truth. That the Antichrist was revealed a long, long time ago. 500 A.D. The world, the Christian world, knew who the Antichrist was, is, and always will be. He must be revealed before Christ returns. We just was never told, in our generation at least, how long ago the Antichrist was revealed. 
almost back to the days of, uh, of the, uh, you know, John the Revelator wrote his revelation in 95 AD. It was only 400 years later that the Antichrist was revealed to the world, that what Paul said was finally fulfilled to everyone's recognition. Everybody identified the papacy as that power that replaced the Caesars. There's never been a question in Bible-believing Christianity about who the Antichrist is ever since. Okay? That's the historical understanding and belief. And it has never changed, and it never will change. The truth never changes. We're consistent in that belief. We're opposed by the whole world, but we are consistent in that belief. It doesn't embarrass me one whit that 99.999% of the quote-unquote Christian world disagrees with me. It doesn't embarrass me one bit. It doesn't raise my suspicions of error one bit. I'm just as sure in my understanding and my belief as the sun comes up in the east tomorrow. It's they that have to worry about what they believe. Not me. I don't have to worry. I have historical proof that I'm correct. They have a fiction, a futurist pipe dream that has destroyed their very power of reason. Who's going to remain standing in the end when Christ returns? I'm going boldly before the throne of grace. They will hide in the rocks. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, Tom. Um, let me just go a little bit into that. I, I, I need to say something. These books, these movies, DVDs, cinema movies, whatever, they were popular. The truth never is and never was popular. They teach you what is going to happen in the end times through entertainment. And entertainment is what the devil uses to take you away from the Bible. Because reading and studying the Bible, being led by the Holy Spirit doing that, is not entertaining. Entertaining is leisure time. As a real Bible-believing, Jesus Christ-following Christian, you do not have leisure time. You live Jesus Christ every second of your life. When the devil gets to you through entertainment, you know that you are in the fangs of the adversary. And there you have to get out. They got the whole world by popular teaching. What Tom and I preach here is not popular, but it's the truth. And that's a very big difference. And that's just the point that I wanted to make. Entertainment, popular, leisure time spending, or truth, hard work, hard study, being led by the Holy Spirit, being led into the truth. Those two are opposites. And the question is, which one is it that you choose? That one will determine your way. That one will determine whether you are deluded or you are led into truth. Let me put it this way. Okay, Tom? Yep. So, let's go into the quote. The proper eschatological term for the view must, uh, must, sorry, the proper eschatological term for the view most taught today is futurism, which fuels the confusion of dispensationalism. The futuristic school of Bible prophecy came from the Roman Catholic Church, specifically her Jesuit theologians. However, the alternative has been believed for centuries. 
The alternative is known as historicism. Futurism has crept into the Protestant Church. It is a matter of uh, it is a matter for deep regret that those who hold and advocate the futurist system at the present day, Protestants as they are for the most part, are thus really playing into the hands of Rome and helping to screen the papacy from detection as the Antichrist. That's right. The Jesuits have succeeded in using the Protestants to destroy the Protestant foundation. Now do you see how dangerous the Jesuits are? The Jesuits have caused Protestants to destroy the Protestant foundation. The very reason that we exist is to protest the Antichrist papacy. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. But now, Protestants exonerate the papacy. They destroy their own foundation by exonerating the papacy. The papacy is not the Antichrist. It's Carpathia, a single individual that probably going to look a lot like Mitt Romney. A rich, powerful, tall, dark, and handsome, with deep-set eyes, a black shirt and a black suit, and black tinted glasses, with graying temples. And he's going to rule the world and cause the sacrifices and oblations on Temple Mount in Jerusalem to cease in a rebuilt temple. That's what they got us all believing. Yeah, they even had me believing it. And I called myself a Protestant, but there wasn't a fiber of Protestantism in me. My Protestant foundation was destroyed. And they know we're all destroyed. They're gleeful that we're all destroyed. They destroyed their most lethal enemy. The truth, the biblical, historical, and prophetic truth, they destroyed it with one stroke of genius. They never had to fire a shot. They never had to hang anybody. They never had to boil anybody in oil. They never had to gut anybody. They never had to have a uh, an inquisition they never had to have a war all they did was teach us to believe a lie and our foundation is taken from out from under us and we are known the world over as a laughing stock that's what protestantism is today protestantism is not respected anywhere in the world because we've defied our own foundation. We did it on our own, we did it willingly, and we vigorously defend our error. That's how successful the Jesuits were in destroying us, never had to shed a, blot, a drop of blood. Not a single drop of Protestant blood was necessary to destroy the Protestant Reformation and everything that took place from 1517 on. All of it wiped away. It's not only wiped away, it's harmless. It's ridiculed. It's a spectacle. A calamity. Because we ourselves taught our own destruction from every Protestant and evangelical pulpit all over the world. Does anybody weep over this? Does anybody hang their head in shame? Does anybody drop to the ground on their face in sackcloth and ashes and say, I was wrong? 
A Thief in the Night was wrong. The Left Behind series of videos was wrong. That futurism was wrong. That the Jesuits lied to us and we bought their sickness, their lies, hook, line, and sinker, and destroyed ourselves. We committed spiritual suicide. We drank the futurist poison, and it has poisoned us to death. There's hardly any of us left. Is there any repentance left before the last of us passes? Is there any repentance left before the last of us passes? I'm 65 years old. How much time do I have left? How many are there, are there that are historicists beside me? How long will they live before our attempt to restore historicism is forever lost? I feel like Daniel. You ever read Daniel's chapter 9, the first part of that book? Daniel is on his knees before the Lord in, in gut-wrenching prayer. He confesses his own sins and the sins of his fathers, the sins of the whole nation of Israel. He's at the same place that I am. Confessing his own personal sins and the sins of his own people, which are God's chosen people, the Jews. They had forsaken his law. They had stepped all over his law, trampled all over his law. They would bowed down and worshipped images and idols. They had sinned before the Lord. And because of that, where they were taken off into a sinful Babylonian idolatrous nation to serve as slaves. You want to be an idolater like the Babylonians? Then you go to Babylon and do it. That's what happened. All Israel, all the Jews were taken off into Babylonian captivity to be slaves to idolaters. Those who cared nothing for God's law and worshipped and bowed down to Im images and idols. False gods that can neither see nor hear nor, nor, nor answer prayer. No righteousness in them. They don't even exist. There's only but one God. So there was Daniel and all the chosen people. They'd lost their nation. They were on their faces serving idolaters. And Daniel was, was devastated. Who in the world is going to represent the name of God Almighty but these who are now in Babylonian captivity, reduced to nothing? Daniel was afraid that the name of God would be erased from the world. And Daniel was simply praying, Father, for your own name's sake, save your people. Who will testify to the world about you if we are destroyed? The last vestige of the truth was 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 wrapped up in the Jewish people. The hope of the world was wrapped up in the Jewish people. And if God allowed them to be destroyed, there'd be no witness in the world about the truth. Well, the same goes for Protestantism today. We're down to the last man. We're the only ones who can represent the Most High God, the truth of the Bible. We're the only ones. And the last of us are about to die of old age. Are not we all to be on our faces before the Lord, just like Daniel was? Is not the situation that we are in the same critical situation that the Jews were in? It's the same thing. We are made slaves all over the world to an idolatrous Roman Catholic papacy. The Nebuchadnezzar of our day. We are all in Babylonian captivity today. And the last of us are about to die. Won't we get on our faces in repentance before the Lord and ask him to restore us? And do you know how that restoration will come? Only 
through the restoration of the historicist school of Bible prophecy interpretation that says the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus Messiah the Prince 2,000 years ago, exactly the way Daniel prophesied it, exactly the way it's recorded in history in the New Testament, and the futurists that we believe are all liars. We condemn them. We damn them to their own judgment, and we correct our ways before the Lord. And now he's got a people for his name. Will we do it? Or will the world go without a witness? The President DeJoya's invitation started me thinking about the many similarities between Jesuits and News Corporation. Uh, but both the Jesuits and News Corporation attract highly talented people from all over the globe. Both the Jesuits and News Corporation like to challenge the status quo. And both the Jesuits and News Corporation have a reputation for independence and innovation. Of course, there are some differences. I don't want to discourage anyone who might be considering the priesthood. Uh, but I will tell you that at News Corporation, we don't insist on vows of poverty or chastity. Um, and as chief executive, I can tell you that I'm sometimes not sure about the degree of obedience either. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. DUP leader Ian Paisley was jostled, punched and then dragged out of the European Parliament today after interrupting a speech by the Pope. The disturbance came within seconds of the Pope starting to speak. Other Euro MPs responded angrily when Dr. Paisley heckled the Pope, saying he was the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II Antichrist, a reference to the view supported by Archbishop Cranmer in Reformation times that by claiming to be God's earthly representative, popes have usurped the position of Christ. He remained unrepentant despite being accused of being a bigot. But let me say this, if the honor of Christ is at stake, I would put my whole political career on the line for the honor of Jesus Christ in this group. I happen to be a Protestant by conviction, and I'm not going to sell my Protestant heritage.